Hello and welcome to Inform Friday. I'm Lila Angelaka and I work in the technical research team. In case you haven't seen any of our previous lives, this is a new series of discussions about traditional buildings where we are presenting a, a short topic each time, followed by live Q&A. The, the series also aims to introduce you to our inform guides uh, and each session will be corresponding to one or more of our published guides. These guides are short publications giving general technical advice for homeowners and covering the basics on a number of topics. We will also be occasionally linking to other relevant publications. Um, so a few weeks ago, we discussed traditional Scottish roofs and today we'll be looking at traditional windows and broadly speaking, SAS and case. As usual, if you would like to ask a question, you can do this now via our Facebook page or log into our YouTube channel with your Google account. The event will be recorded, so if you if you miss it, it will be available to watch it afterwards. If we don't manage to answer your question today, we will try to do so at the next session, or if it's something quite specific, uh, please email us at technicalresearch at hs.scot, and anything we won't be able to answer today, we will be getting back to you through our email address. I will now welcome our usual guest, uh, Mr. Roger Curtis, our manager, and he will go through the basics of window composition and common maintenance issues. And I will continue with upgrade options as it's quite a hot topic at the moment. So hello, Roger, and let's get started. Hi, well, thank you for joining, <clears throat> joining our series. And as Leela said, we're gonna be looking at, uh, at windows today. And we reckon that actually we'll just keep it to one type, which is the, the, the Scottish main type in Scotland generally, which is the sliding sash and case. So the a bit of history now, just to give uh, a little bit of context and background, probably the earlier ones had um, multi panes. Uh, this image um, is from a sort of 17th century building in Scotland and shows the, the, the model that sort of evolved around that time. It, it's possible that that it actually um, evolved from a, a horizontal um, sash and case, which um, what you can see here on this picture, which is uh, actually a building in the Scottish borders. Um, and there is evidence in some tower houses of, of vertical slots in the side of window openings where some form of, of, of sliding cat sash came across. So it may be that that's where it came from. Baltazan Castle in Ayrshire has, has this feature, which is really quite interesting. Um, but it quickly seemed to have um, evolved into the pattern that we that we see now, which is the, the standard um, six over six pattern, and uh, often as part of a, a, a wider architectural composition, which you can see on the, on, on the next image here, um, a very standard makeup in Scotland with the painted window bands, and uh, and the rendered finish to the masonry and you're getting a feel for the some of the imperfections of of older glass as well which shows up quite well here and that's one of the uh, quite often attractive features of, of some glazing patterns that you have original glass which is often quite thick perhaps three millimeters for some of the older types uh, gradually glass is, has got thicker over time uh, the way we've made it uh, and safety reasons and other things um, We'll now just go to a, uh, a diagram of, of, of a sash and case, which is the sort of cut through really, which is, is, is a bit complicated and you, you might not see too well, but we'll, we'll zoom in at some point. Um, and essentially showing how the, the vertical uh, sashes, the, the bits that go up and down are, are set within a timber case that is in itself is um, set against the, the masonry of the window opening. And, uh, presses up against the the outer um, uh, the outer layer of masonry that that holds it in around the edge, and uh, often um, there's quite a lot that goes with the sash as well. Uh, and moving downwards, you can see the the shutter arrangements and the paneling that goes with that. And then at the bottom of the window, cut through, um, you can see the window sill itself. And um, there's a little bit of detail that if we get time, we'll go back to, but that should just protrude over the stonework a little bit. And then on the right hand side, you can see the uh, those gray lines. They're the they're the sash weights that uh, counterbalance the, the weight of the sash and keep the opening um, easy. In, in the top of that window, you'll see a, a little slotted panel at the top at the head, as they call it sometimes. And that's the trickle vent, which we we may come back to if we if we get a bit of time. And then above the window, 
the actual window case itself, you can see the, the timber um, supporting the, the masonry uh, over the top of the window. Um, we'll, we, can, we can dive back into this diagram if, if people have questions, but that's perhaps the, the general variation on that. Obviously, depending on, on, the, on, the, on the wealth and presentation of the building, not everyone had shutters. They might have had a more plain arrangement, but the window itself is, is, is pretty much like that with a little variation um, over the years. And, and we can come into a touch of detail on that later on. So that's pretty much the, the basic makeup. And it's the same from Campbelltown to Cromarty, down to Edinburgh, Dumfriesshire, and, and, and pretty much all over. And a fair bit um, in England as well, actually, although the pattern uh, varies a little bit. Um, I mentioned about dating a window and getting a feel for, for how old something might be. What one of the ways you can tell is by looking at the theatrical patterns and uh, the image that's been put up just now gives you kind of very simplified view of four types with the the, the earlier type 1690s or so quite quite a wide um, piece of piece of timber often hardwood quite often oak and made quite often of more than one piece so it's it's sort of laminated as it were um, and then later on uh, by the 18th century so sort of 1750 or so, you've got a, a more rectangular piece, but with a sort of scalloping on the edge, which is quite common. And in fact, that carried on um, through in Scotland for, for a long time. So it's it's quite hard to be specific. Certainly by the late 19th century, you had that pointed uh, astragal, which is the top, the top right image, sometimes called a lamb's tongue uh, and quite thin, um, maybe around 20 millimeters or so depending on the size. And then in the early 20th century, one of the architectural uh, developments was, uh, was uh, sort of more in the arts and crafts tradition. And quite often they, they went for a slightly thicker, fatter astragal um, uh, as, as a way of the, the developing architectural idiom in Scotland. So that's uh, just a quick sort of cant around. And, and by way of example of, of what a, a seriously old sash does look like, the, uh, the image that's just gonna come up is, um, is a sash that got kind of stuck in somebody's attic years ago and if you remember the previous image with the, the sort of 1690 pattern you can see it's kind of quite wide and slim uh, all the glass has been taken out of that but there was a tiny piece left uh, and it was about literally th three three millimeters thick so it's so very very thin quite lightly constructed um, uh, and again this could be um, the house itself is is early 18th century so that this this could be from, from that time. Um, so that's a little a little bit of history and background. Um, in terms of the, the overall um, presentation of a building, the, the, the fenestration is, is quite an important part of its com composition. And, and many um, traditional Scottish houses uh, use the glazing as a way of presenting various degrees of, of formality on, a, on an elevation. This is um, probably an early 19th century, maybe late 18th building um, in Lauder in Southern Scotland, where the owner has recently um, been tidying up the windows um, and uh, re reinstating damaged and broken bits. And, it, and it's part of the, the overall uh, presentation of a building. And uh, perhaps at the next image where I show you where the glazing has been changed, you can definitely see there's a change in the, the architectural messaging uh, of, of, the, of the building. And, and possibly I would argue that it looks um, it looks better <laughs> as it was. So this is um, uh, social housing, a uh, council housing in um, in Stornoway as as no strong um, in Orkney. Sorry, it's um, in Kirkwall in Orkney. And the right hand side you can see is has got the original uh, glazing, probably from the nineteen uh, thirties nineteen forties. And on the other side, the left hand side, that's been uh, changed to to a more modern pattern and and i think the the architecture is uh, is singing better uh, on the on the older side so just to give a feeling it, it kind of can dignify quite a quite a, a modest size house and and just keep that that um customary scottish look which uh which uh we're, we're trying to trying to maintain and a, and a note on um on window color as well um it is quite easy to think that uh, all windows are white but in fact um, in Scotland in the 18th and 19th century often they they use much darker colors 
um, and this case shows um, a townhouse on the south side of Edinburgh, which um, still retained its, its dark green uh, window paint and door, which sort of set the windows sort of subordinate within the overall architectural pattern. And uh, other colors were used too, darkish reds, brown was very common. Um, Glasgow, you can see quite a lot of um, green windows on tenements still still surviving. Um, so don't feel that that, that white is the, is the default color. Um, certainly the, the older tradition was, was, for, was, was for darker. The, this building got modernized a few years ago and um, the, the owner did a good job of, of tidying up the windows, but they're, uh, they're definitely white now. Um, <clears throat> so just ponder on that and you may find earlier paint layers underneath the, um, the paint that you have on, on, on your windows. So perhaps uh, scrape, scrape down and, and see what you think. Um, and maybe I'll I'll touch on 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 maintenance as well, and and maybe we can take um, questions from from the audience in due course. Um, so, what one characteristic of of older timber windows is firstly the quality of the timber they used, which was generally um, a slow grown a slow grown pine, not always from Scotland. It often came from Scandinavia, from the Baltic states. And then by the mid to late 19th century, a lot of um, uh, softwood uh, was coming over from the west coast of, of the United States. And that was superb quality, slow grown, possibly um, first growth timber. So many hundreds of years old, growing slowly, very resinous and very resistant um, to decay. And, and this image here with the, with the contractor proudly pointing at their scarfed in piece gives you an indication of, of what quality timber looks like. The grain is quite close, it's quite dark. If you scrape that, you'd get a sort of oily uh, resin scrape, which you could almost um, you know, put your nose and smell the, and smell the resin. Um, you'll, you'll see from the astrical pattern there that that's probably a, an early 19th or even 18th century uh, window. And where you see the mortise coming up through the, the, uh, the sill, the, the top layer of the, of the lower sash, that's always a good sign of a sort of well-made quality, quality window. In this particular case, there's been a bit of decay and just by the fellow's finger that they've scarfed in a new piece. And then if you look to the right-hand side, you'll see that is new new timber uh, for a new case. So the good thing about the, these, the, these things is you can repair, repair and replace all the little bits as you need to. Um, I have to admit, it is quite time consuming and it is quite expensive, but we would like to argue you're holding the architectural integrity, you're holding the, the traditional fabric, uh, you're reducing waste uh, to, to landfill, keeping uh, resources and, in, and maintaining the embodied carbon of, of that timber, which certainly um, some modern alternatives don't have uh, quite the same uh, credentials for what we would call the circular economy. Um, even if their operational energy um, use is much lower, but we'll touch on we'll touch on um, thermal upgrade um, once Leela starts in a minute. And then the second image in in the repair sequence I've got here uh, shows um, the lower part of a sash case. Uh, this is on a building in Aberdeenshire. In Aberdeen, uh, the granite is the clue there. So the lower part of the sill um, had got decayed, and that's been scarfed in. Uh, sorry, the lower part of the, the sash case, sometimes called the pulley style. And then the sill itself, which is the, the, the flatter bit in the, in the lower middle of the image has been, um, nearly the whole thing has been replaced. So it's sometimes called a half sill replacement. And it's quite interesting. You can see a, a few traces of earlier paint colors on the right hand side there, giving a feel for, for how the, the interior was painted. So that sort of repair is, is good because you're not taking out the whole window, you're not damaging the plaster, you're not creating dust and mess. Um, it, it, it will cost, of course it will, but um, you're, you're fixing something that can continue to last for easily another 100, 150 years or so. So I'll probably, um, <clears throat> I'll probably stop there on the, on the overall works. <laughs> And then Leela will, will, will catch up on thermal upgrades and some improvements. We're gonna rattle through things quite quickly because um, 
we, we want sort of exchange and dialogue with with the audience so um, yeah I was actually you... thinking thinking that we could maybe um, go through some of the questions we had because the they're relevant to maintenance so we had one question from paul on facebook he's saying that he's south facing a uh, wooden shots in case windows are really rotten uh, so they need to be replaced uh, but he has patched them up uh, quite reasonably uh, but he is sometimes seeing condensation inside the panes which clears if i open the secondary glazing uh, I, so I assume this is down to moisture in the wood evaporating. Will this store itself out over time? Um, th this this is mentioned occasionally with 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 secondary glazing and and getting condensation in that because of course you're creating a an area of lower temperature um, which is not connected to the to the original layer. Um, generally, the suggestion there is you might need trickle vents in the sashes. Or giving additional provision for ventilation. Sometimes, if the sashes are quite air leaky, which of course is why you did the secondary glazing in the first place, that can address it. Um, so that would be the first. Uh, that would be the first option there. And I think is uh, the same. Paul uh, asked another question: How long might we normally uh, take to build new windows? And would the old ones need to be removed and boarded up? so that they can be measured up it it slightly depends um normally you can measure up um, a sash window in place because you take the stone size so the, the distance apart of your stone your opening the hard size as they sometimes call it is the same dimension of the pulley styles the 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 inside uh, measurement of the case so that's a very easy measurement you don't need to take it out to to, to mend it uh, to measure it up Sometimes you can take sashes out, take them back to the workshop, repair them in situ, board up the window using the case, uh, and then put them back in. Um, and as, as I sort of implied, taking out the case itself, if you want to do the whole thing, uh, that, that's quite a big job. But generally the case is in pretty good condition all the way around on the sides and the top. But as you saw in that image, quite often it needs the, 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 the sill addressing. Um, so I hope that sort of helps on that one. In terms of time scale, um, a manufacturing joiner can probably uh, make a new sash and case window in probably a couple of days, uh, depending on how their tooling is set up and if they have the right cutters for the astragals and, and other bits and pieces. So it's not in itself a, a particularly long, complicated task. Did I see another question there about planning or something? Uh, there's there's a question from William on YouTube, uh, whether there is evidence of double glazing, like a sandwich of two panes, ever having been thought of in Scotland before the 20th century? Um, I don't think so, but, but I, I've, I, certainly in Sweden they were doing um, various layers in the late 19th century, early 20th, but then their sort of thermal imperative was slightly higher. I think probably in Scotland we we went for shutters and roller blinds as as a way of managing light and 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 temperature, which Leela will touch on. Um, yeah, I think I think I might have to uh, actually talk a little bit about upgrade, and then we can have more questions and join them up with the history and maintenance because they they do go together. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. So. Generally, as Roger mentioned, just in case windows are extremely durable, and if they're maintained correctly, they can last for over a hundred years, as we've seen in Scotland in in many, 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 many buildings. Uh, however, traditional traditional glazing is considered to be drafty; is you know, it's quite thin, and often is blamed for significant heat loss uh, from buildings. Generally, when we when we look at upgrade for uh, upgrading windows, traditional windows, it's important to remember that the existing window fabric should be retained wherever possible and not only for visual character reasons but also because older wood is usually of better quality however that doesn't mean you can't do anything to your windows and many improvements can be made to make them more thermally efficient without damaging the the, the actual fabric or their appearance so the first thing to think of if we start from sort of the lower uh, lower impact things is uh, blinds and curtains. They're very easy options and they're quite good for reducing heat loss. So blinds, curtains, shutters can significantly reduce uh, heat loss with no impact on the existing window fabric. Uh, 
and roller blinds were actually commonly used to windows in the 19th century. Similarly with curtains, uh, if you put full length, full lined and well fitted curtains, they can actually control drafts pretty well. And we've done a few trials and we've seen that they can actually reduce heat loss by 14%. And they also don't have any impact on the actual window fabric, uh, but care should be taken that they don't obstruct radiators. Uh, then shutters that we touched a bit on, many older properties have shutters and they're very good for, for both heat retention but also for security. In some cases, some buildings were not constructed with shutters but they have imitation filled panels and they look like shutters but they're just panels. Um, so if you, if you think about restoring shutters or putting them where they didn't used to be, it, it can be a good option. Um, but when you're restoring shutters that have been there, you, you need to think about basically um, the removing the paint if they're painted closed. It's quite a, it's, it's a straightforward job and it's, it's a good idea. And the benefits are considerable uh, as thermal imaging can reveal, which we have an, an image just to show you. It's quite interesting uh, here. So you see that the middle one is the one that has the shutters. Um, and so a combination of, of different methods like um, blinds, shutters and curtains can reduce heat loss actually by as much as 62%. The shutters alone, I think it's up to 51%. So it's significant. Uh, so they can actually do a good job. And if you wish to improve them further, you can apply a thin aerogel blanket on the filter panels, on the inside of the filter panels, and then um, put some plywood on top. If you're putting new shutters, again, these can be glazed. Um, I'm not sure we have an image of this, but we do have in our guides and you will see, we'll be linking to inform guides and our short guide, so you will be able to see some more information on, on these options. Uh, oh yeah, they, these are the, um, the shutters, the glazed shutters. Um, then one step further is draft stripping. Uh, the image that you will see, it's taken from Hollywood Park Lodge. We did a number of works there. Um, to improve its thermal uh, energy efficiency. And actually draft stripping can reduce leakage by 80% and there's a, there are a range of products out there. But remember that when, when you do do that, ventilation is quite important. So remember to have, uh, if you have trickle vents, keep them open. And generally they are, they are quite encouraged to have uh, trickle vents, especially when you're thinking about new windows. Uh, so that's one thing to consider. Then we have secondary glazing, which comes in, again, a range of options. It can be glass or polycarbonate, and the frame can be timber or aluminum. It's quite good for acoustic reduction. You get great improvement in U values without a, like a detrimental impact on the, on the fabric. There may not be sufficient space when when there are working shutters, so you have to think about that and what actually works for your individual window. Uh, but but there are also other types nowadays. So there's the magnetic strips that you can you can basically frame the window with a magnetic strip that can easily come on and off. Um, I think there's a company called Glaze and Save that does that. So the, the, there are a few, there's a few options there. Um, sometimes external secondary glazing may be necessary, uh, especially when there is a vandalism, like protection from vandalism, and that would that could outweigh the the visual impact of having the uh, external secondary glazing. But usually, when we're talking about tenements and and townhouses, it's usually on the inside. Uh, another option, which is quite good, is vacuum panes. Uh, and they're they're quite they're quite thin. Uh, it's nearly the same thickness as modern single panes. It's 60 millimeters, so they can go very easily into the existing sashes. They're a little bit expensive, and there is a minimum size uh, on them, but they're quite good and they're suitable mostly for over one over one windows. But that's the same with um, double glazing, which we'll touch on. Um, generally, just to say here when we're talking about uh, sort of pain uh, upgrading the the actual glass panes. Generally, the removal of crown glass, if there is, is discouraged given the rarity of the surviving examples and the significant value, visual value that the the crown glass has, and it adds to the building elevation. But where where appropriate uh, and where the timber frames are in good condition, 
it's it's quite a good option to just um, replace the glass panes with upgraded ones, and and vacuum panes are a very good option. Um, then there is double glazing, so you can either go for a, a new double glazer windows or fitting double glaze panes into existing sashes. Uh, in some cases where the, the existing windows are not original or are beyond repair, there the may be an opportunity to actually have a conservation gain, as we call it, by installing a new timber double glazed window with a traditional pattern. So here the photo is from a new Sasson case window in a listed building in Stromness. And it actually replaced the modern type that had failed and was not appropriate for the building. So in those cases, it's quite good to think about both like an upgraded version, but also the conservation gain that you you actually give to your building. In such cases, as we mentioned before, you would need trickle vents if you're putting these double glazed units uh, just to keep the, the ventilation going. Um, last but not least, um, if, if you're thinking about new sashes in existing cases, that, that's also an option where the timber of the chassis is in poor condition and cannot be saved. Uh, yet the window case is good or in like repairable condition. New sashes with double glazing can be made to fit the existing cases following the original pattern and the paint sizes and style of the window. So generally, if you want to know more about uh, what we've done, our studies, we've done a range of tests uh, through our uh, refurbishment projects. Uh, so we've published a lot of case studies and there is a couple of technical papers, especially technical paper one that you will get a link somewhere. It's about thermal performance of traditional windows and you get actually a breakdown of the options with the U values if you if you want to know a little bit more. Um, I think that's that was quite a quick uh, rundown for me and we can we can take some more questions actually on upgrading of windows. Yeah. And have we got a few coming through on the chat? Uh... We do, we do. Uh, so there's, there's a question, um, general question from Jonathan on YouTube. Uh, if you had the opportunity to buy a Victorian villa with a wide range of problems or a modern efficient home, which would you choose? Well, it depends what you want. Um, because it's me, I guess I'd go for the old one and I wouldn't see problems, I'd see opportunities and a chance for maybe tidying things up. Um, modern construction views uh, older buildings as, as, as a series of unknowns or difficulties. And, and I think that's mostly due to lack of familiarity, really. Uh, and certainly repairing older stuff is, is extremely rewarding. You're not consuming resources. You're getting something going that perhaps has fallen down a bit. I accept you might need to do some thermal upgrades and are energy efficiency short guide short guide number one as it's called is on our website and that will steer you through some of the um, up, thermal upgrade options and to, my, my view is most traditional materials stone masonry uh, timber slate lead is all actually pretty it's, it's not difficult and, and please don't let folk tell you it's hard and difficult and dangerous we've been using this for nearly 800 years i think we've probably got it got it worked out so i'd be i'd go for the older house actually it doesn't mean the new house isn't available there's more people we need new houses so of course folk have got to live somewhere and obviously you know a good energy efficient house is is good um but because it's me i'll stick with the old one it's, it's also about the quality for me quality of material what, what you get so depending on the quality of the older house and depending on the quality of the newer house <laughs> um we had a question from Paul on Facebook. Uh, he's in a listed C building in Edinburgh, but no conservation area. What permissions might I need? So in that case, you would actually need to speak to the council because every council, uh, local authority, I mean, Edinburgh council, they have their own policies and their own ways of dealing with these. So it's likely that you need listed building consent, but you would need to speak to them. Um, Another question uh, from Hazel on Facebook. Um, incredible to see these window frames lasting for hundreds of years. There was new shots and case windows in both my past tenement flats and again in my more modern house. How does the lifetime of modern shots and case windows compare to more traditional windows? Which we touched a bit on that one. Yeah, um, I mean, basically modern timber, tend the trees grow quicker because it's warmer and there's more water. 
so the quality of the timber is slightly less and you you can you can choose timber carefully obviously um it, it isn't as good but if you're careful and they're looked after um you should get a very respectable life there is a, a modern way of treating timber now which gives it a a i think they call it a hydrolyzation process and it's called a coir which gives you an, an additional bit of durability of softwood without having to go for a hardwood and using hardwoods in windows it is it is fine but it's it means you're importing it from somewhere generally not europe um so there are ca carbon and and sustainability questions within that so yes of course yeah um, yeah there's another question coming isn't there gosh <clears throat> yes uh william on youtube he grew up in a house in five which had these traditional shutters which we they never used and generally you can still see them and they're painted closed a useful feature but why don't we use them it's a good question. I, 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 th I think it's habit. Folk have just fallen out of the habit. And I think post-war people were wanting to do things differently. Um, of course, when you close a shutter, it, it makes it very dark. So it's a, it's a kind of nighttime option. Good security feature on a ground floor as well. So yeah, if you've got them, if you've got them, why don't you use them? Yeah. I'm a firm believer in that. I'm supportive of shutters. Um, we had a few questions that came in as, as uh, emails, so maybe we can go through them. We had a, a question from Chris via email, and he was asking about the red, dark red putty that forms the seal between the stonework and the timber window case, and it had become detached. He was asking what it's made of and where he can purchase some. And we actually have a question that shows the, the sand mastic, which is a mix of fine sand and linseed oil. And you can actually buy it in store. You can make it yourself. Uh, it comes in a pale color, reddish, and actually some companies I think they make a range of options. Yeah, you can you can get the pale stuff, and then you can get quite the strong red stuff, which um, yeah, just depending what you're trying to match in. Um, we have got a picture of, of of happy of good sand mastic work and and slightly not quite so good, which we'll put up at the end if we get time. Um, now I'm seeing. Yeah, there's what, what another. There's another question from Tom on YouTube. Um, he would like us to talk a bit about trickle vents, um, why yeah. trickle vents, vents are recommended and how window ventilation is related yeah. to ventilation across the whole house. Right, okay, now somewhere we have got a trickle vent image on the, on, on the, on the, on the slide deck there, yeah. that's it, thank you. Um, so generally, when windows were originally made back in the day, they deliberately kept them with a modest amount of air in intake, i.e. gaps, to allow the hearth to draw. So that was a sort of deliberate decision not to make them hyper airtight or as excessively airtight. Obviously now with various regulations and expectations, people make very much, uh, Sash and Case that are much uh, more airtight, but that can lead to lack of ventilation in rooms. Uh, which is why the building regulations require trickle vents. And you'll see those on UBVC windows uh, and timber windows alike. Um, so that's a requirement for, for health. Um, in my opinion, trickle vents alone are not enough to ventilate for a healthy indoor uh, climate. And a Scottish Government a report by Building Standards Division in 2014 identified that in bedrooms, trickle vents are not sufficient ventilation. So it's quite an interesting topic. And, and then, of course, a lot of people draft strip sash and case windows to improve their air tightness. But then you are sort of required to put in trickle vents too, which seems um, a little bit of a contradiction. So, and, and in the wider ventilation strategy, trickle vents in windows, I would suggest are only part of it. And in an older building, you're relying on um, fortuitous ventilation from the skirtings and the floors um, or, or just shock horror actually opening the windows a little bit uh, and using that maybe in conjunction with the draw from a hearth even if you're not necessarily burning a hearth it's quite an important way of getting air moving around the, the, the building so um, in this diagram here we've got the recommended or a suggested option for fitting uh, the trickle vent feature it goes in at the head of the window uh, and, and then you can see the, uh, the the slot on the inside face that that lets the air in. That's it there. It's showing showing quite well. There are many other ways of doing it. I think this is quite a good one. Some of them are 
uh, are done into the actual sash itself. And I'm not sure if that's quite so good, that these are quite thin uh, pieces of timber already, and uh, you don't want to be making too many holes in them, uh, and they can be quite quite sort of conspicuous. So the, the detail in the head of the window here, in the case, the top part of the case, uh, I, I would suggest is a, is a good option. And um, basically, uh, Tom further uh, asked the question where, whether actually trickle vents are a room ventilation issue or a window ventilation issue, which is quite a good uh, one to explain. Uh, another way of our, our trickle vents are room ventilation. Uh, uh, I would say they they are for the benefit of the room. They are there to keep fresh air coming in, keeping that relative humidity down. W one, if you have excessive condensation on your window, and you're in a a sort of normally uh, normal building, you're either underheating it, or you have too much humidity in the air, or you're you're not ventilating it right. So condensation, even on single glazing, is quite often a sign that the indoor conditions are not not quite as not quite as they should be. Yeah, um, uh, we had another question from John on Facebook. What timber do we recommend for repairs? Um, if you're piecing in a, a, a sort of modest area, maybe a foot long or a bit longer, I would suggest salvage timber is is the best option. Um, uh, pitch pine is the, is the way you describe it uh, and you can tell it by its weight and by its smell so when you cut it and, and sniff it it's got a lovely resinous to, weight to it uh, and a piece of scrap timber or an off cut of something older can look pretty horrid on the outside but if you plane a face you, you'll see pretty quickly if it's if it's good you what you're wanting is a kind of orange orange yellow red ish tint if it's very white and the grain is very open, uh, and almost if you can see the tree rings more than a couple of mil apart, that's probably a bit of modern, faster grown material. Um, so ask the joiner if they have any offcuts of older timber lying around, because it'll it'll be better, better quality, and more stable. And I think now that we are still on the sort of maintenance and repair issues, uh, maybe we should actually show the image of um, of the sand mastic because uh, yeah, I think it's very uh, interesting for people I'm, to see. Yeah, I'm surprised we haven't had more questions about that because um, it, it seems to be quite common. Uh, so I think at the end of the the slide deck, we've got we, we've got a a picture there somewhere. Um, there we are. So that's um that's some quite old sand mastic reasonably well done it's shrunk a little bit but what we're trying to show in that one is that it's in the plane of the stone it's not sticking out at all and it and it's just filling up that that gap between the masonry and the and the timber of the of the case often um if you're building a new a new house and you have sash and case windows that gap is very small because nothing's moved and it, and it sits up very tight uh, and, and you almost almost don't need the mastic at all um, just by contrast, though, we'll show the other image, which happens quite a lot now, um, where people think, well, if a little bit of sand mastic is a good thing, a huge amount must be even better. And, and that's really not the case. Um, it started to bleed into the stone, which is the linseed oil is so much there, it's, it's coloring the stone. Um, it's put on at right angle at, at 45 degrees onto the um, the outer edge of the of the case on the vertical bit there just by the masonry and then more seriously the it's been um, chamfered on, on, onto the lower part of the sill there so that's the bottom of the image where it's um, not allowing the water to drip clear of the timber uh, and as mastic uh, hard, hardens and cures it, it, it shrinks very slightly so that that that, it, that leading edge is just going to catch the water um, and, and it won't help the sill uh, shed the water and, and keep dry. So that's perhaps over enthusiastic use. Uh, I'd be itching to get my putty knife on that and, and, and pare it down a little bit. Um, yes, yeah, so that, that's a useful one just to clear up. And let's go back to the previous image just to, just to remind folk of, of how that, that right-hand edge of the window should look. So press flush in the plane of the, of the stonework is, is, is how you should be doing it. Good. Okay. Are there any questions that we've missed or any points we, that the audience want to? 
we had some general comments about uh, basically the you know that it's too expensive to repair and play session case windows uh, and i think that's something you could talk yeah. a bit more about yeah i mean we, we can't hide from that question um certainly a, a big new session case window is an expensive beast you know we're talking north of 900 quid um which is why my, my suggestion is you 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 repair what you can now some of the repairs you see are, are almost like, like like it's furniture uh, and it depends on that on the skill and capability of your joiner uh, but even if you even if some of the sashes maybe a, a, a beyond repair you can get new sashes done within the existing case uh, which keeps the cost down and, and importantly too saves on the the internal disruption of taking the case out as you can see from that diagram it, it, it's uh, you know it's quite a complex assemblage really um, with or without shutters so if you can minimize that and all the dust and disturbance inside the house um, I'd, I'd stick with repairing uh, if, if, if possible um, in the meantime we had another question uh, is there any point trying to source old timber window fittings for architectural salvage companies particularly seals and I think you answered it a bit um, I, I think it, it's quite hard getting old building bits to fit what you need. Um, and, and generally the sills are the bits that weather first anyway. So the chances of having um, a good sill that you can pick up on, you can get pre-run uh, sills from, from joinery manufacturers already, already cut. Um, and, and I think probably for the, and then if you do get a, a and, and salvage people don't have individual sills, they, they, I, I don't think they keep that. They might have an entire window, which of course won't fit your window because that would be too easy, wouldn't it? Um, so my suggestion is you you go for um, sill blanks, which you can get run up from uh, joinery manufacturers, suppliers, uh, is perhaps the option, the option there. Um, another question that came up uh, from Facebook, should the mastic be painted over? Mine is covered in gloss paint and chucks are falling off the window. Yeah, that uh, this is this is quite a good question. Um, do I paint the sand mastic or not? And I think we've had a few uh, questions on this in the past as well. Um, generally, my view is is probably not, as it tends to curl back. I think the way the oil dries tends to mean it curls back. But often, after a hundred years of of keen painting by the painters, it's ended up being covered anyway. Um, but if I was doing new work and I was redoing the window and the mastic need redoing, I'd, I'd keep the two, I'd, I'd keep the two separate. So re, repaint the uh, repaint the windows, obviously. Um, take out the old sand mastic, put in new mastic, but don't paint it. Good. Uh, I think that we've had some general comments about uh, basically um, limitations, I guess, to changing windows. And I think that's a that's a subject that it's quite separate in in a way, and you should always speak to your council because every local authority and and council area they have their own regulations. Generally, there are many options, and there's a lot of things that you can do. Uh, it, it really depends also if your wind if your building is listed, if you're in a conservation area. But always check with the local authority, and I think somewhere we'll put some links to managing change guidance for windows, which gives you a bit more information. Uh, on how to actually look look at uh, look at that um, generally yes i mean repair and maintenance you don't need consent for so if you're just doing painting and repairing and tidying up that, that's fine you, you know, you're okay there it's when you want to change something that you might need to uh, check and planning the way planning works is that the local authority are the first port of call that, that's how it works and not every planning thing comes to comes to hess um and i just noticed that Someone has helped me out with my costs there. Um, this is uh, in Fife. Someone's had a quote for around a thousand for a new window, which is sort of what I might expect, uh, and then three hundred for repair. So that perhaps um, gives you a feel of the of, of, of the difference. Well, that's great. Uh, right. What have we got? Um, any more coming through? 
I don't see anything else coming through, but we can we can give it a few minutes to see if there's anything else. Um, generally, if you also go to the Engine Shed website, we'll we'll put a link. But there's a section with building advice. We we usually put it in our Inform uh, Lives, Inform Friday Lives. It's called building advice, and there are different sections for different elements, and you will see one for windows. So it's quite good. It has uh, common issues and maintenance and, and general advice. Oh, I've just seen some questions now. I've worked out. I've worked out the chat thing because I'm <laughs> I've got clever. Um, right, paint. Ah, paint. Now there's a topic. Um, good question. There's a range of paint options now. Um, for for retail consumers, uh, you will only get water-based paint now, which generally works fine. Um, if if we're being sort of if we're being purist about it, I'd be suggesting a linseed oil paint, which binds very well with the existing timber and 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 what would have soaked in from older paints. And if it's done right, it is um, it's incredibly durable. We're we're looking at a sort of seven seven year refreshing cycle, uh, and depending on the exposure, maybe even longer before you you need actually need to 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 repaint again. Um, so I think. Uh, linseed oil paint would be our sort of suggestion but actually if you're a you know, depending what your painter is, is, is comfortable with um, uh, and and water-based paints are the sort of more commonly available now um, which again if you get the right the right way of doing it and you clean things off properly work work, work pretty well um, yeah, we had we had a question, a more general question about, I guess, timber. It's not just limited to windows, uh, but how do you treat woodworm infestation? Woodworm infestation. Um, like a lot of things, woodworm is a funny one. Um, it's a mixture of of the pe of the timber quality, and it's a mixture of the conditions which you're putting the woodworm in. And generally, if you have a quite a warm, humid environment, or even a not very warm, quite humid environment, with modest to low quality timber, that the little um, the little bugs will start will start eating it. Um, you see it a lot in attics because people have insulated with mineral wool or something on 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 the rafters, and you've created a cooler space. Um, with a lower dew point, and therefore you have a higher humidity often in the winter and and they get munching, but often it's only on the sapwood and, and they don't quite get terribly deep in. So my my take on, on woodworm is you address the conditions that that are giving it that, that they get up and go, which quite often is ventilation or temperature. Um, there are treatments available, but they're kind of dealing with the symptom and not the cause. So for, for my money, I, I'll be looking at the internal ambient conditions that, that lead to it um, before you um, before you uh, get stuck into the chemicals. Yeah, uh, we had another question from Lily on YouTube. Apologies for my sound, by the way. Um, so she's asking that uh, about the trickle vent that we showed and that it can become quite dirty over time. How would we clean that space? Um, a sill. Sorry, cleaning a cleaning a, a trickle trickle vent. Um, it's on the well. It's on, it's on the sort of non-building side. So um, I think probably that the faceplate can be unscrewed and unscrew the faceplate. Put the Hoover in there screw it back on again is, is perhaps the short answer. So probably every maybe five years or so, hopefully. Yeah, they, they don't get too bad. And I, I personally clean mine with just, I dust them f more frequently. And I think by dusting them and just letting the air out, actually, it helps sort of clean them automatically a bit. Maybe the hoover with the brushy bit on the end. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, we um, had another question from John of Facebook. How would you fill the gap with mastic where you have a really large gap? Which is a very good question, and we can bring yeah. up the the section of the window again. 
yeah when when the gap gets really big it, it, it starts to sort of become a masonry question more of a sand mastic question so the um yeah the sort of left hand side of, of that there there is a sort of a pressed quite often people use rolled newspaper if the, if the gap is quite large which gives you something to push the the mastic back into um if it's really large your window's moving and and, and all, all the masonry has, has twisted and distorted and and it, i suspect you might need a and of course it depends what you mean by large but i'd suggest anything over 25 millimeters is getting getting a bit on the large side uh, and you may want to use a, a mortar to, to to fill that gap as, as a better way sand mastic is not a it is not a sort of substitute for mortar it, it, it it's thin it's, it does small gaps and it does it flexibly that, that's why it's there so if it's if it's big uh, i'll be using a, a mortar that's good. Let's see if we have any more questions. Yeah, we have one more from Anna on Facebook. Um, she's repainting her window interiors due to flaking, uh, due to condensation. Some of the internal putty is loose and coming out, resulting in a groove that would collect the condensation. Can I refill with linseed oil putty? And what prep should she do? Right. So when you when the when the glazier or the joiner put the glass in back in the day they, they'd put the putty all the way around and then they'd press the glass up against it so as you say as 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 uh, anna has mentioned you you get a sort of two or th two mil sort of bead of of putty round on the inside and as as she's indicated over time and maybe if the condensation is perhaps more than it should be that quite often breaks up and it sort of flicks up when you're dusting um and and I think, as you say, um, be good to get that in. M my suggestion is to have a, a, some linseed oil on a paintbrush and run some into that gap first, and then press in a uh, a small amount of, of of the linseed oil putty, as as you suggest, with with a knife squashing it in hard. I'd be also thinking, should I be having this much condensation? So underheating will result in condensation, as well as um, uh, poor ventilation because the RH in the room is is too high. Um, so may, maybe just just think about the the wider factors that that might be causing it. Um, that sounds good. Let's see if we have any more questions. We'll give it maybe another another uh, two minutes or so until we we start wrapping it up. Um, but happy, yeah, happy to take uh, more questions. And uh, as we mentioned before, happy to for you to email us at technicalresearch at hgs.scot if you have any any more detailed questions. And it looks like yes, in fact, there's I think there's a, a comment here about the uh, about the wide gap. Um, yeah, if if the gap gets staffed big, it means that either the window is moving or the stone is moving. Um, so perhaps uh, look in a bit more detail about that. Good. Okay. Right. Well, um, yeah, that might, that might be it, unless you get any more questions. But if, if that's it, uh, then we will have to wrap it up here. And I will thank Roger and thank you to everyone who tuned in again. If you enjoyed it, you can leave a comment and follow us for more because there will be coming. Uh, there will more. <laughs> there will be more coming. However, this is the last of our spring series, and we will be back for more after the summer. The next sessions will include topics like damp issues and tenement maintenance and energy upgrades. In the meantime, if you if you can look at our building advice section in the engine shed website that I mentioned before, or if you have any specific questions, email us at the email address, uh, technicalresearch at hs.scot. And uh, we're happy to also take suggestions for future inform live events. And thank you very much for joining us. Thank you, Roger, again. and. Have a good rest of your day. Goodbye.